Uh, for the last three years, uh, we have seen story after story after story on Vice President Kamala Harris. We have seen stories, folks talking about, oh, how she's unprepared, how she's not ready, how she's, I mean, just you name it. All of these different stories. Uh, staff overhaul, tension, and oh, people leaving, and oh, she's not up to the task, and what does she really believe in, and really what's, what she's thinking. I mean, we can go down the ladder. So this week, Two more stories were done. Go to my iPad. This is in the New York Times. Uh, this brother, the New York Times, the story is called In Search of Kamala Harris. After nearly three years, the vice president is still struggling to make the case for herself and feels she shouldn't have to. The author, uh, as you see here, is uh, a Steve W. Herndon. Uh, he's a brother uh, who, with the New York Times. And so that's his story on her. And so then uh, there's another story uh, that was done on her. This time uh, is uh, this one here. It's in uh, The Atlantic. Go to my iPad. It's called The Kamala Harris Problem. And so uh, in this particular article here, uh, again, it lays out again in terms of what the problem is. And so when you read, and in fact, even in this story right here, uh, it lays out all of these different stories uh, right here uh, in the paragraph. But after nearly three years in office, the symbolic fact of Harris's position has proved more resonant than anything she's actually done with it. From almost the beginning, Harris's vice presidency has unfolded in a series of brutal headlines, exasperation and dysfunction. Inside Kamala Harris's frustrating start as vice president, a Kamala Harris staff exodus reignited questions about her leadership style. New book says Biden called Harris a work in progress. Kamala Harris is trying to define her vice presidency. Even her allies are tired of waiting. And it goes on and on and on and on. There have been story after story after story after story. Let me explain something to y'all. How many stories did y'all see on Mike Pence as vice president to Donald Trump? I wait. How many stories did y'all see about Joe Biden when he was Obama's vice president? I'll wait. How many stories did you see about Dick Cheney and George W. Bush? How many stories did you actually see Al Gore as the vice president to Bill Clinton, George H.W. Bush to the vice president of Ronald Reagan? Uh, hey, uh, Walter Mondale, the vice president to Jimmy Carter. We got Spiro, Spiro T. Agnew, the vice president to Nixon. You saw more stories on him when he resigned and then later was found guilty uh, of corruption. So bottom line, y'all, hey, hell, when LBJ was vice president uh, to Kennedy, it's not like you saw a bunch of stories there. So what am I trying to get to? Don't nobody give a damn about the vice president. Everybody knows the role of the vice president of the United States. What do they say? It's to attend funerals and to cut ribbons. The focus is on the president. I'll give you a perfect example. When Biden came out the other day to talk about what's happening uh, with uh, Israel, who was he standing with? Blinken, the Secretary of State, Kamala Harris, vice president. The reality is, we have seen more of Vice President Kamala Harris. We've heard her speak more, be involved in more things publicly than we ever have any other vice president. And so when you read these stories, I mean, I, I just sit here and I just go, what, what the hell are y'all talking about? Uh, and so, uh, right here, uh, the, in this story about uh, Herndon, oh, how uh, Harris, uh, this, is the, this is the opening, all the conditions seem right for a chance to reset the narrative. Go to my iPad. Really? The Munich, sec the Munich Security Conference in February. Y'all, wasn't nobody paying attention to that damn conference in, uh, wasn't nobody. In this country, we focus on the president. And then you go through here, you talk about, oh, how well, you know, she didn't really 
get a applause. It was polite applause. Then they go through here and they talked about her being a rising star uh, with an inside track to be the next Democratic presidential nominee. No, she wasn't. Vice President Kamala Harris, excuse me, Vice President Kamala Harris as senator had no inside track to be the next nominee. She had to run like everybody else. And then the story talks about a disappointing 2020 campaign. And it was. It was. They made some blunders in the campaign. But then when you go through this article here, they go back to M Munich. And then they go on about, oh, how Biden and Harris should be doing a lot better. And the polling numbers and all different things along those lines. And uh, I love this here. In interviews with more than 75 people in the vice president's orbit, there's little agreement about Harris at all, except an acknowledgement that she has a public perception problem, a self-fulfilling spiral of bad press and bad polls, compounded by the realities of racism and sexism. Duh. Duh. So you go through the article, and you see more stuff. You see the attacks on her by Nikki Haley. And then you see the more attacks. And then you see all of these stories, the case for Biden dropped Kamala Harris, all, all this sort of nonsense. And then, of course, when you have fellow Democrats who... Uh, in the case of C. Elizabeth Warren, who did not want to speak affirmatively about Harris being the nominee, and then how she called twice to apologize, Harris wouldn't take her phone calls. When Nancy Pelosi uh, went on and, and didn't really want to answer the question, uh, when some other candidates did not want to answer the question, we can go on and on and on. These things laid out. And, it, and so they interview some African Americans in this story, and, and then you go on here. And so I love this one here. I call the top Democratic pollsters to gauge whether a Harris-led party kept them up at night. I talk with members of Biden's vice presidential selection committee to ask the question I've always wanted to know the answer to. Was Kamala Harris really chosen as a running mate because she had the right identity at the right time, the highest profile diversity hire in America? Here's why that is a bullshit-ass question from this brother. I'm going to roll y'all back to 2008. Do y'all remember... The black man with a sunny, uh, with a funny sounding name. Do y'all remember what they said in 2008? <sighs> Obama, he can't, he can't pick a woman. America, oh, America, not ready for a black man and a white woman. They can, a, a, a black man and a woman to be the president and the vice president. Oh no, America ain't ready for that. So what did they say? Oh, you know what? <sighs> if Obama gonna win, he gonna have to get. He gonna have to pick an old white man. He need an old white man to go talk to the white people in the Rust Belt states. So he need a white man to go talk to the people in Pennsylvania and Michigan and Wisconsin and Minnesota and Iowa and Illinois and Ohio. He gonna need a white man to go talk to the folk in the South. Am I the only person who remembers that? Am I the only per Oh, Obama, he ain't got no experience on the national stage. So who, guess what? He gonna have to pick a white man with some significant foreign policy experience. Hmm, Joe Biden sits on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee with Obama. You know what? That's a great pick. Ooh, we got an old white guy who's from Scranton, Pennsylvania, who's got foreign policy experience, and then the old white guy can make all the white folk comfortable with the black guy with the funny name being president. Now, y'all notice, don't nobody ever call Biden a diversity pick. I hope y'all understanding what I'm breaking down here. Nobody calls Biden a diversity pick, even though that's exactly what Biden was. Y'all notice that any time it's somebody black or Latino, it's, ooh, are you a diversity pick? But didn't nobody ask the question about picking the white old man as the vice president about being a diversity pick? Let, let me continue. And so you see the article here. In nearly three years in office, Harris has stood dutifully by Biden's side. But in terms of her own political profile, she has remained a vacuum of negative space, a vessel for supporters and detractors to feel as they choose, not least because she refuses to do so herself. Uh-huh. And then 
she's quoted in here. And then they talk about how she like, look, I ain't trying to define my stuff. Uh, and then when someone asked, what does Vice President Kamala Harris bring to the ticket? What is that clear answer? I asked her team made clear it would be my final question. Were you in this room of 2000 people? She asked. I nodded. Did you see them cheering and standing? Yes, that's what I say. She stood up and walked out of the room. You further go into this story. And you hear them talking about when she ran for president and when she got attacked uh, by Tulsi Gabbard uh, for her criminal justice program and, and when she was the vice president and all of that. And let me be perfectly clear, that was her biggest mistake, and I told her and her people that when she was running. I literally said, publicly and privately, y'all know I ain't got a problem saying stuff publicly. I said, vice, I said then Senator Kamala Harris needs to define her law enforcement career because we were running in a period where people had a different view of somebody who had been in law enforcement. It took her campaign six months to release her criminal justice profile. She was being attacked early on because she was a prosecutor. That was one of the biggest mistakes that her campaign made. One of the other big mistakes that her campaign made was that when she became United States Senator, she did not lock down black people. Follow me what I'm saying. I said then, God rest his soul, to Tyrone Gale, who was her, one of her press people. I said, Tyrone, y'all run around doing all this white media. She, she, she should be locking down black media. I said, look, she gonna run for president in 2020. Guess what? I said, Cory Booker gonna be running for president as well. Cory Booker and Kamala Harris both of them did not do what I said they should have been doing. They should have been on black radio every three months talking about what was going on. Obama wasn't doing a lot of interviews with black radio. I had to call them out for him, for him to do his first interview 18 months after he had been elected. Sure did. Got the emails to prove it. So that was a mistake. She didn't do my TV One show until she was United States Senator for nine months. I had to cuss out Tyrone when she was on some other MSNBC show. I said, damn that, bro, what you doing? Here's why I'm saying that. You got to show up your black base. So although she was an African-American woman, although she was a United States senator, a bunch of black folks had never heard of Kamala Harris. So had she actually done more black radio, done black media, she would have shored up her base, then would have had that base because they would have been hearing from her on a regular basis. I literally had Michael Steele, the chairman the Michael Steele, the chair of the Republican National Committee, accepted more of my invitations to come on my Tom Jordan Morning Show segment than Kamala Harris and Cory Booker did combined. That was a mistake. But let me tell y'all, well, th here's the deal, though. When she drops out, I dare say, between her dropping out and getting the nomination, and I got, she did my t my, this show... More, more combined more than she did with TV One show uh, and this one when she was in the campaign. Why? Because she wanted to be the nominee. And you know who I credit for that? Sabrina Singh, who was one of her press people because she understood. I was communicating with her a lot because she understood where she needed to be. So when you read all of these stories, you just need to understand what is going on here. All of these stories about how what she's not doing and what she should be doing uh, and, and how she needs to be defining herself and how she needs to be uh, more involved. Um, in this story here, uh, they, they have in this story here, uh, they talk about how, you know, it was Gwen Eiffel who name-checked her on appearance on David Letterman, uh, and they talk about how they call her the female Barack, Barack Obama. See, that's part of the problem right there. C Kamala Harris was never the female Barack Obama. Different circumstances. In fact, when you read the article right here, uh, the writer talks about uh, what she did and what she didn't do, how she didn't have much of a legislative uh, background uh, and how she had, did not have a history of passing a whole bunch of bills and things along those lines. Uh, and so when you're reading this article, uh, he lays it in here. And of course, I had to start laughing uh, when I was uh, reading the article. 
I really did to start laughing because they talked about uh, how all the different things that Obama did uh, when he was uh, in the legislature. Uh, but y'all, let's be real, I was there. Obama wasn't doing those things. It was Senate President Emil Jones. Senate President Emil Jones told a lot of people, take your name off the bills, put Obama's name on the bills. That's why Rebecca Crowley is laughing right now because she know I ain't lying. Uh, and so, because Obama went to Emil Jones and said, uh, Emil, you can, make the United, you can make the next United States Senator. Do y'all know why? Because Senate President President Emil Jones in Illinois, he wasn't getting no respect. Do you know who was getting respect in Illinois? Governor, Ma Co uh, excuse me, Mayor Daley, Governor Rob Lagovich, as well as Mike Madigan, who was Speaker of the House. So Emil Jones, uh, African American Senate President, was getting no respect from the white folks in them, so uh, in Illinois. So Obama saw the opening, went to him, appealed to his ego, and Emil was like, "You right, we gonna make him the next United States Senator." That's why Obama got all those bills passed in a year and a half. It wasn't because he was some brilliant legislator because Emil Jones knew he needed a record to run on. Just so y'all understand what happens when you have context when writing these stories. So, I'm sitting here reading these stories, and again, uh, the same writer, this brother, he talks with um, a particular, he, so he's asking uh, her all of these different questions and wants her uh, to be speaking on the record. He talks to a, a fundraiser saying how all these other people uh, are reaching out to him and how they are uh, raising money and how they are doing all of these different things, but uh, Kamala Harris is not doing any of those things. Let me explain something to y'all. Anybody knows politics, Kamala Harris can't do that because she's the vice president. If Kamala Harris was sitting here assembling her own coterie of donors, folk would be saying, what you doing? Your job is to support Joe Biden. Well, y'all, understand, when you're the vice president of the United States, do you know what your job is? Yes, Mr. President. Where do you want me to go? Yes, Mr. President. I'll do that. Yes, Mr. President. I'll give that speech. Do you know who did that? Joe Biden. When he was President Obama's vice president. He was number two. Everybody knows you ain't running the show when you're the number two. You have to defer to the leader. That's why you're there. So all of these stories demanding that Vice President Kamala Harris create her own team and she should be out there fundraising, she literally can't. And I'm going to go ahead and say it. There are some people on Team Biden who needs to keep her in place. Let me be real clear. Folk are threatened because she's 59 years old. Oh, I, I, I'm, see, I'm going to go ahead and say what other people cannot say. There's no doubt in my mind that there are some people in the orbit of Joe Biden who played a role in a lot of those stories being put out. In fact, in one of these articles, there's a staffer of the vice president's who criticized the amount of time that she spends on her hair and her clothes. She a woman. She a black woman. Okay? It ain't and like in one of the articles. She gets to just jump up, take a shower, or throw some clothes on, walk out the door. Hello? That's called self-sabotage on inside your own team. So I need y'all to understand something. I need y'all, when y'all reading these stories, you got to be asking yourself the question, why do I keep seeing all these same stories? What is actually going on here? Yes, I know Joe Biden is old. I know he's, and people are like, well, could she be the next in line? Guess what? Ain't nobody asking about the number three in line. Oh, by the way, who's the number three to the presidency, the Speaker of the House? Hell, we ain't even got one right now. I'm saying all of this because you need to understand motive. What you need to understand is there are forces at play in the Democratic Party who do not want Vice President Kamala Harris to be the potential nominee come 2028, win or lose in 2024. Oh, I'm telling you right now, there are donors, there are activists, there are, uh, there are consultants who are sitting here going, we got our eyes on some other people. Whitmer in Michigan, the governor of Pennsylvania, 
Pete Buttigieg, who transportation secretary, Gavin Newsom in San Francisco, it's a, excuse me, in California, it's a whole bunch of folks who got their eyes on the White House, and they see Kamala Harris as an impediment to their guy or their gal being the next star of the Democratic Party. So I need y'all to understand when you see these stories. So here, to me, is a mistake that the Harris people are actually making. What has happened is, if you keep seeing these stories and the headline ends up being, and I'm going to go back to it, this is the New York Times headline, is in search of Kamala Harris, they've already decided what the story is. So you're giving all these people access to you and it's the same story. The other story that came from the Atlantic, again, this is the headline, the Kamala Harris problem. Look at the photo right there. Do you know what you don't see in these stories? You don't see them talking about the work that she's doing when it comes to black maternal health. You don't see them in these stories talking about how she's proactively engaging black men and others, which is a problem for the Democratic Party. What you don't see is them writing in all of these stories the actual work that she's doing because what you see, the narrative is she's never at work. She's never at work. She's never at work. She's never at work. Even though there are the photos, there are all kind of video available, uh, even including this week when she was sitting next to Vice President, next to President uh, Biden in the Situation Room uh, as they were uh, looking at what was happening uh, in Israel. You're not going to see them talking about that. You're not going to see them talking about those different things because that doesn't help the narrative of the folks who are being said. See, this right here, that's what VPs do. They stand back and they support the president. So for you to understand, so what then happens? Every time one of these stories is written, all of a sudden, the public perception. If I go back to one of the stories, what is she going to do to change the public perception? Well, you're the one writing the story. So if your story is establishing that she is a problem, if your story is establishing that, oh, she can't figure out who she is, then guess what? It's a problem. Let me take y'all back to Obama and Joe Biden. Let, let me be real clear. When Obama was running for, when he was running for the United States, for the state Senate, Obama supported gay marriage. But then when he chose to run for the United States Senate, he knew he couldn't be in support of gay marriage because he knew that wasn't a winning strategy then. So guess what? He stood before the debates and talked about how he believed marriage between a man and a woman. Obama never believed that. He never did. But he knew he had to say it in order to run. On the same stage Hillary said it, she didn't believe it. On the same stage Joe Biden said it, he didn't believe it. But they knew they had to say it because the polling data was clear where the voters were. So what happened in the term? Obama still wouldn't support same-sex marriage. But it was Joe Biden who went on Meet the Press. Obama was pissed because he felt that oh, Biden got in front of his skis. Biden actually was the one who spoke out publicly in favor of same-sex marriage, which then forced Obama to go do an interview with Robin Roberts and affirm his support of it. And guess what happened? The polling had already changed. So it was now safe to support same-sex marriage because it wasn't a political liability. These are facts. I remember going on CNN, and they were Wolf Willis like, Roland, Obama's evolved. I was like, no, he didn't. Obama evolved, devolved, and he evolved back. I'm just stating fact, y'all. Obama literally signed a questionnaire from an LGBT group when he was running for state senator saying that he affirmed same-sex marriage. He later changed his position. These are facts. So I'm not sitting here, oh, my God, rolling you out in Obama. No, that's actually what happened. I'm just simply not living in la-la land and being delusional about what actually happened. So why am I saying all of that? If you read all of these articles and if you see how they are asking, well, what's Kamala Harris' position on this, position on that? She can't say it because she cannot be in opposition to the president. So when you're the vice president, you actually can't give your own opinion. You can't define yourself because when you're the vice president of the United States, you are defined by the president. You can be steadfast in disagreement with the president, but you got to support him. You know who knows that? Joe Biden. 
He was trying to give advice. He was trying to give Obama advice when it came to uh, the Member Disabilities Act uh, and also the issue of birth control. Remember the nuns and that sort of went out. Biden Bi knew when a Catholic folks was going to stand because he's Catholic. Bi Obama had a different position. He gave us advice, but once the president made his decision, he had to go with it. That's what Kamala Harris is. So the problem is all of these stories are trying to get Kamala Harris to say or do something that separates her from Biden, and she can't. Vice President Kamala Harris will never be free to be who she is until she's no longer playing second fiddle to Biden. Now, if Biden and Harris wins in 2024, then by the second year, she then gets to get more freedom. Why? Because she has to position herself for her own campaign in 2028. Biden knows that, and so he's going to have to go ahead and do your thing, but because she still is going to be head of the Senate and she has to still make decisions, she still has to be march marching in lockstep with the president. So when y'all see all of these stories attacking her, you need to understand there's a motive behind it. And here's the last point, which arguably I think is the most important point. America is a sexist country. America, including women in America, have a problem with a woman being president. And so the constant attacks on Vice President Kamala Harris is the fact that she's also a woman. Yes, we've had a female Speaker of the House, but, but this is the first female vice president. We ain't never had a female president. Israel has had a female leader. Pakistan has had a female leader. Germany has had a female leader. India has had a female leader. The Philippines have had, has had a female leader. Liberia has had a female leader. The United States has never had one. And so a lot of these questions, is she ready? Can she do the job? Is she up to the task? The reality is it's also a function of her gender. And so you need to understand when you read these stories, you have to understand framing. When I see a story, I understand what I'm seeing right here. This is the Atlantic story. Few people seem to think she's ready to be president. Why? Shall I take y'all back to Hillary Clinton and people saying that no woman or no person has ever been that ready to be president and there were still people saying she can't? Oh, let me remind y'all, how many of y'all remember? I'm sure Scott, Rebecca, and Larry remembers Joe Biden, oh my God, Joe Biden could never be president. He's a buffoon. He's a gaff machine. He makes too many mistakes. He says crazy stuff. He plagiarizes. Do y'all remember all of those things that were said about Joe Biden when he was vice president? They said, Joe, just move, go on out and just move on out and just retire and go do a think tank and make you some money. You'll never be president. Y'all, Joe Biden been trying to be president of the United States since he was 30 years old. And guess what he is right now? He's the president. He was always going to run for a second term. So here's what I think the Harris people should do. The Harris people should stop trying to impress national media, national white media. Look, you ain't going to get a fair shake. What they should be doing is spend their time talking to columnists at major newspapers, giving them some face time that they never actually get. I guarantee you the kind of column is going to be a lot different than what you're seeing in these stories. Stop giving these reporters, uh, you know, four or five, six interviews because you see what's actually going to be here. Also, force them to actually look at the policies that you're doing. Force them to actually cover it. If you actually read both of these stories, you're not going to actually see anything in them talking about the very policy things she has been involved in because that's not what the goal is. But most importantly, they should have the vice president blanketing 
black media. This summer was a great thing that they actually did. You know what they did this summer? She was speaking at all different conferences. She spoke to the Deltas. She spoke to, uh, I think, to the AKAs, and, uh, no, uh, the AKAs too. But now AKAs next year. Spoke to the Deltas. She was speaking uh, to different groups. She should have. They should have had her at the National Association of Black Journalists, which was in Birmingham, talking about the Alabama redistricting case. She should have had her also at the Alpha Convention, talking to brothers and the Kappa Convention in Tampa because they got a black male problem. They missed a the boat on that one. They should say, if there's a national black convention, the vice president is going to be at every single one of them, speaking at every single one of them. She should be at the national black NBA convention. She should be at the national medical association, the national bar association, every single one, because guess what? You have to frame yourself. They are trying to hope that doing these big national stories will reframe who she is. Y'all, that ain't happening. It's the wrong strategy. Rebecca, your thoughts. Look, I think you summed it up well. Uh, when we started to see um, these reports coming out, especially in a lot of the Washington, D.C. area um, papers, um, we knew it was coming from inside the House. We knew that it was friendly fire. We knew it was folks um, on the Democratic side who were jockeying for a position after Biden is no longer the president. Um, you know, some of this is kitchen table talk, so I'll just keep it. I'll do the non-kitchen table talk. Um, mm. I mean, there were certain people's fingerprints that we saw all over it. Um, there's people on the, you know, before my uh, current job, there are people who I've worked with on the Democratic side for many years, decades, and I recognize when they're pushing certain things in the press. And that's what I recognized when I saw um, some of those initial um, uh, stories about her. They wanted her to be the angry black bitch so bad, and that's not who Kamala is. That isn't who she is as vice president. And so because she isn't the angry black bitch, now they have to figure out other ways to disqualify her. And especially when we see this reoccurring cadence about Joe Biden's age, it's not about Joe Biden, but it is a soft whistle for people to understand, hey, if he's too old, if he's too frail, if he isn't mentally aware, then that means that Kamala is the one who's really um, pushing all of the buttons over at the White House. That's what that ageism story Story with Biden is all about. It was never about him or his age, but it was more of, do we really want Kamala Harris as the next leader of the Democratic Party? Larry? So I think there are a couple things that, you know, based on the points that you made, is that what Vice President Harris is dealing with is this, generally society, they don't want Black women to be great. <laughs> and you talk about the intersection of racism and sexism, which it, which it is. Also, you look her, her resume is impeccable. You know, uh, attorney general in the state of California, only the Senate, second black woman ever elected to the uh, U.S. Senate after Carol, Carol Mosey Braun, and the first woman and the first black woman to ever be VP. Her credentials speak for themselves. But once again, in our society, as you highlighted, and you know, we talk about this, she's shattered the glass ceiling in many respects. And so she's the second most powerful person in the world. And there are a lot of people, and not just people outside of our community, some folks in our community, they just they can't handle that. Um, this whole story about, particularly the last couple of days, about her hair and, and her clothes and things like that, this is frivolous. We're dealing with making sure we're maintaining our democracy and supporting Americans to make sure they have food on the table. And so if she wasn't for properly prepared and came out, we already know how that story would go. So we have to focus on, on, on the issues that are important. Once again, she is more qualified than the majority of members in the House and Senate. <laughs> who have been there for years. Her, her credentials speak for herself. It is unfortunate, but once again, Roland, I agree with you in terms of they, she needs to go to black media. She needs to continue to talk, about, talk to black organizations and entities to talk about the things the Biden administration has done in terms of policy and infrastructure bill, how DOJ has taken on a civil rights um, division, has taken on a lot of these corrections officers and police departments. She needs to highlight these issues. And also, once again, it's part of our lived experience. So when we see her, we see ourselves. Scott, before I go to, on that point that Larry just said, absolutely, one of the greatest mistakes of the Biden-Harris administration, had they have not been trumpeting the amazing work of the Civil Rights Division and holding cops accountable and holding jailers and wardens accountable in the prosecution of hate crimes, 
That's what they should be touting. But, Scott, I'm going to read this piece of this Atlantic story. To me, again, this is just the dumb bullshit that you see in these stories. In the first year of his presidency, Biden did little to present Harris as essential to the administration. Neither did the Democratic Party more broadly. Indeed, there was a sense that Harris might be a liability more than anything else. Less than two weeks into office, Harris appeared on a West Virginia news station to pitch the Biden administration's coronavirus stimulus package, which Joe Manchin, the state's conservative Democratic senator, was not yet sold on. In an interview on the same station the next day, Manchin said he was shocked that Harris had given him no notice of the appearance. I couldn't believe it. That's not the way of working together. Later that year, as my colleague Franklin Ford has reported, Biden invited Manchin to the Oval Office to discuss the stimulus package. Harris was there initially, but after pleasantries was sent on her way. Biden had once said that Harris would be the last voice in the room doing important conversations, not this time. First, Scott, here's why this paragraph is completely bullshit. If anybody goes back to the first year, when you saw Biden speak, he often had her speak first, then he spoke. That was one. Two, she doesn't do that interview unless it was cleared with the White House Communications Office. Her communications staff ain't out there just freelancing on their own. Three, this was being Joe Manchin being a pissant, as, as if you got to get my permission to do interviews in my state. That's bullshit. And so, four, when Manchin met with him, Biden served in the Senate all those years. She wasn't even there that long. And so Biden meeting with Manchin by himself is no shock because he has a relationship with her. So when you see the whole deal here, but after pleasantries, she was sent on her way right there. That, fra that line right there alone cast it as, oh, she was discarded. Oh, she'll be the last person in the room. Everybody knows what the phrase, the last person in the room means. When I'm making decisions, I'm factoring your advice and counsel in. It doesn't mean she's going to be sitting in on every conversation of the president. That did not happen with Cheney and Bush, did not happen with Bush and Reagan, Gore and Clinton, Biden, Obama, Mondale Carter. So what all of these national media media doing, they are creating a Kamala Harris standard that is completely different from every other vice president in modern history. Yeah, uh, you know, and, and Manchin, that was his white privilege. How dare this black woman come to my jurisdiction, whether she vice president or not, without telling me. Really? I got to get your permission to come to your jurisdiction, whether we won West Virginia or not? Um, uh, secondly, you know, Rowan, your breakdown was excellent, and I agree with it. I offer one friendly supplement. This shit is hard. <laughs> it's hard being yes. number two when you've been number one, defining yourself as the first, in many instances, prosecutor, AG, Senate, even as a senator, you're defining yourself. Her cross-examination of witnesses was masterful, right? And now she's number two, and her agenda and definition is Joe Biden's, as you said, not hers. It's hard to operate in that space, whoever you are, with no prior experience or definition of, of this space, which is why... Uh, the former speaker for California, one of the reasons was Willie Brown said before she accepted this nomination, you should go be AG, define yourself. You won't be under the White House scrutiny or thumb, and you can build your own constituencies. Well, she went for vice president. God bless her, right? But this is hard stuff. And the backdrop of racism and sexism and all the other points that you raise make it even harder, Right? She is not herself very often when she's talking. When she was a senator or an AG, you saw the real Kamala right. Harris. Smart, funny, brilliant, independent, fighting. As number two, she's carrying Biden's baggage and speaking for Biden and like Biden and, and has these contours around her. You don't see the real her because, as you say, her agenda is Biden's agenda. It's not hers. And she's doing the best she can and doing a hell of a job, quite frankly, despite all those challenges you mentioned, including the infighting and Biden's people doing her in. So the one time, uh, the I, one I think I, that's what I think. The one time you actually have heard 
Vice President Kamala Harris without the vetting of the White House? Folks, if y'all find it, let me know. When she spoke extemporaneously at the Buffalo funeral, she, yeah. was, she wasn't yeah. supposed yeah. to speak. Yeah. Reverend Al Sharpton said, She's not scheduled to speak, but I need the vice president to come up here and make some remarks. If y'all listen to that speech, let me know if y'all find it. If you listen to that speech, you will hear Vice President Kamala Harris. It wasn't written. It wasn't vetted by the White House. It wasn't right. in check it. When you hear you say, and I, I said to her folk, that's the best I've heard her since she's been vice president to that point. But I'm, a, I'm, I'm a, let me know if y'all find this, but I, I got to read this because I need y'all to understand, again, when certain comments are stated, what they meant. This is the Atlantic article. For now, Senate Democrats are not fighting for time with Harris when she's on the Hill. Quote, you'd be hard pressed to find a Democratic office that actually engages with her or her team on a regular basis. One Democratic Senator's chief of staff told me, traditionally, this person said, Officials from the executive branch who visit the Capitol are cornered by lawmakers hoping to get their priorities before the president, but few people are scrambling to make alliances with Harris, not because of any dislike, as this person and other congressional officials told me, but simply because of uncertainty about the nature of her role. In her case, the chief of staff said, it's kind of like, hey, good to see you, and that's kind of the end of it. Now, let me explain to something y'all right now why this is utter bullshit. Senator Harry Reid, do y'all remember when they were negotiating a funding bill? Vice President Biden cut a deal with Mitch McConnell. Harry Reid said, keep that son of a bitch out, out of the room. They refused to talk to Biden because Reid felt that Biden gave too many concessions to McConnell. So this whole notion that, oh, no, that's how it works, the reality is this here. There's a coterie of people who are around Biden. They say the power's with us. Hell, Jamie Harrison is the head of the DNC, and he can't move like he needs to move, and we've seen stories how he's been frustrated. Y'all notice a common theme here? Black DNC chair frustrated. What's up with the vice president? What's her role? The reality is... The role of Vice President Kamala Harris is the role of every other vice president. That person is the number two. Everybody on Capitol Hill knows the power is in the Oval Office at 1600 Pennsylvania. That's what everybody knows. So people need to understand what's going on here and how this thing is. We played these speeches. We've shown these different things. If you want to actually hear Vice President Kamala Harris in her own voice, not stilted, not uh, unsure, not I need to sound like what the White House wants me to sound like. This is her in Buffalo when 10 black people were gunned down by a racist. Good afternoon, church. <laughs> to the Whitfield family, the father of the Whitfield family, Mr. Whitfield. The pain that this family is feeling right now and the nine other families here in Buffalo, I cannot even begin to express our collective pain as a nation for what you are feeling in such an extreme way. To not only lose someone that you love, but through an act of extreme violence and hate, and I do believe that our nation right now is experiencing an epidemic of hate. And as we know, and scripture teaches us, when we talk about strength, the strength of personality, the strength of spirit, the strength of faith, I think we all know 
that a true measure of strength is not based on who you beat down, it's based on who you lift up. <laughs> who you lift up. And it means then also in that strength understanding we will not allow small people to create fear in our communities that we will not be afraid to stand up for what is right to speak truth even when it may be difficult to hear and speak. There's a through line. What happened here in Buffalo, in Texas, in Atlanta, in Orlando? What happened at the synagogues? And so this is a moment that requires all good people, all God-loving people to stand up and say, we will not stand for this. Enough is enough. We will come together based on what we all know we have in common and we will not let those people who are motivated by hate separate us or make us feel fear. So I'm here to say that we are all in this together. No one should ever be made to fight alone. We are stronger than those who would try to hurt us think that we are. We are strong. We are strong in our faith. We are strong in our belief about what is right and our determination to act, to ensure that we protect all those who deserve to be protected, that we see all those who deserve to be seen, that we hear the voices of the people, and that we rise up in solidarity to speak out against this and to speak to our better angels. Thank you. I'm not, now, I'm not going to play the speech that she gave the Tyree Nichols funeral, but that was a written speech that she gave at the Tyree Nichols funeral. Sound totally different than that one. The point I'm making is this here. Part of the deal is you have to let you have to you have to let go of the reins. So Gene O'Malley Dixon, Anita Dunn, the other folks around there, if y'all want to stop seeing these stories, maybe what y'all gotta do is allow Kamala to be Kamala. Understand that the strategy that you have, the communication strategy that you have, don't make any sense whatsoever. And Scott said it, and I'm telling y'all, it's the dumbest thing in the world that the Biden-Harris Department of Justice has been killing it in police misconduct, patterns and practices, hate crimes uh, uh, victories, putting, putting cops and wardens in jail. And y'all ain't saying nothing. Play to her strengths. Oh, by the way, you might get more black support as well because folks will then see that despite the George Floyd Justice Act not becoming law, you have an active Department of Justice that's actually putting the work in. Let's see what transpires. All right, folks, back to our Roadmark Unfiltered video in just one moment. All right, folks, Curl Prep Natural Hair Solutions is an amazing organic two-step curl-defining system for women, men, and children. You look at this video, you can judge for yourself. People line up uh, to see this product in action and hair shows. When they take a seat to try it, they don't believe it is their hair. You can buy the products at curlprep.com. It works on all hair types. Use the code ROLAND, R-O-L-A-N-D, lowercase letters, to get a 15% discount uh, until October 21st. Now, it's just two steps, sweet butter and sweet defining gel, both at curlprep.com. And also, parents, you can remove the ouch. You will love this system because you can comb the product through your child's hair with your fingers. Seasoned Saints are loving the product as well, and the line has products that are great for twists, braids, locks, weaves, even those wigs and extensions. It's all at curlprep.com. Again, use the code ROLAND, R-O-L-A-N-D, lowercase letters to get a 15% discount. That is until October 21st. Trust me, you will not believe it is your hair. Go to curlprep.com.